call to order the work session Sorry. on the matrix report. We'll begin by going around the room and doing the uh, introduction of ourselves. Amy Dombowski. Amy Dombowski. Bernie Hall, Anchorage Assembly. Adam Trondon. Uh, Tim Steele. Bill Starr. George Michaelis. Mark Mew. Peter Rockford of Kerlock. Chris Bichu, Anchorage Fire. Jerry Aaron? Yes. I'm joining my phone. This is Jennifer Johnston. Thank you, Jennifer. Anyone anyone else there with you? Uh, no. Okay. Mr. McCaleb? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the administration has requested a, a work session um, after you have uh, an opportunity to look at the matrix uh, study that was done. And the matrix study uh, looked at two aspects of operations within the municipality. Uh, one uh, was a mandatory review of the fire department and they'll go over their scope so that everybody understands exactly what they were looking at. And then also they were asked to look at uh, E911 and E911 and the CAD RMS systems that's used by police and fire. And they were asked to come up with recommendations in that regard. Uh, we had the consultants uh, via video conference and uh, we've asked them, and that was part of the contract, that they brief the assembly uh, on their findings. And so that's where we're at right now. And I'd like to turn it over to uh, our consultants to go ahead and brief the two reports. This is Dick Trey, just signing in. Thanks, Dick. Uh, good, good morning. Uh, I'm Richard Brady. I'm the uh, president of Matrix Consulting Group, and I was the project manager on this assignment. And with me is uh, Robert Finn. Uh, our lead analyst on this project, and he's a senior manager with the firm and the head of our fire services project. Um, so I'll just jump right into this. Uh, we put together a PowerPoint presentation which takes our, our our long reports and distills it down to about 15 or 20 pages, and we'd like to take a few minutes to summarize uh, our two reports for you and to uh, and then answer any questions questions that you have about what we did and what we came up with and what we're recommending for the uh, municipality. So um, I'm going to start off with the fire department strategic review and both Robert and I are going to participate in the uh, presentation. I'm going to start off with the introduction and some of the key themes of the project. First of all, uh, let me just talk about what we were asked to do. On the fire department side, uh, the project was termed a fire department strategic review. But I, I, I that means a lot of different things to people. I think I want to make it clear that it was a comprehensive management, staffing, and operations study of the current fire department, but also looking forward to what their needs are in the short and medium term in providing services uh, to citizens in the uh, municipality. Uh, so it was a complete and comprehensive review of everything within the fire department. Uh, within that, special emphasis was, of course, placed on looking at what staffing needs are and uh, different deployment uh, approaches, the way of scheduling staff to efficiently and cost-effectively um, provide services needed to the municipality. And, of course, looking at fire stations now and in the immediate uh, future, to meet appropriate response time standards for uh, Anchorage. Uh, we also looked at the EMS side, at uh, how those services were provided by staff, including the EM EMS, uh, the ambulances uh, that provide the service, and the deployment of personnel, and the way it works and the interaction between the ambulances and, and the, uh, the engine-based people as well. Um, we also looked at training, we looked at fire prevention, uh, and administrative services within the fire department and made recommendations uh, for improvement in each one of these areas uh, throughout the report. Um, this comprehensive study had a comprehensive set of methodologies as well. We extensively interviewed personnel uh, within the fire department um, and not just management staff, but we uh, talked to special purpose people, people who have unique functions in fire prevention and administrative services. Uh, we talked to uh, the association and uh, so a large number of people within the fire department. We supplemented those interviews with an anonymous employee survey, which gave everybody the opportunity to provide input to us uh, about key issues associated with staffing, employment, programmatic needs, uh, 
and meeting the needs and their perspective uh, of residents within the municipality, uh, as well as their specific views about things like training, their involvement in fire prevention, things like that. As you can see, when you look at the report, that it's a very quantitatively based analysis uh, that does two things. It uh, looks at workloads and service levels and looks at things like staff utilization and service level and things like that. But as it relates to deployments of uh, fire and emergency medical services, we use our uh, uh, geographic information system, our GIS system, to uh, show you the, uh, the effectiveness of the current deployment of stations and people, uh, but also where there are issues associated with that and how alternative fire station locations and staffing can address those issues. Part of that, we compared current, current performance metrics uh, against national guidelines or standards, and there's been quite a bit of discussion there. Uh, and this was an interactive process, lastly. We met uh, extensively with command staff, fire department, as well as with the steering committee that included fire department representation, uh, city manager, the, uh, the auditor, and a few other people. So uh, that's a summary of what we You know, in, in all of these... If uh, I can interrupt for just a moment, I, I need to recognize that we've been joined by Assembly Members Birch, Flynn, and Horniman. Please continue. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, when you look at a report like this, you can clearly see that we spend the vast majority of our time analyzing issues and improvement needs. I uh, want make it clear, we do this in the executive summary as well, but there's a lot of very good things that the Anchorage Fire Department are doing now as well. And first of all, it's important to recognize that the uh, service level provided by the fire department, particularly as that relates to fire and emergency medical response, are, are really quite high. And overall, it means uh, a wide variety of standards in providing services. This has been one of the uh, most outstanding department. Like the dots we, that the, this this tropical, well, this this typhoon, Ian is. <laughs> the weather report. No. Okay, I'll continue on. Uh, this fire department is uh, very unusual and in a positive way about its use of uh, technology to uh, drive information through uh, to managers and throughout the department but more importantly than just driving information, use data to manage operations and services. Uh, I think you're in the top 10% of fire departments in the United States in doing that. Uh, training is excellent, uh, and that's important when you consider the diverse uh, needs of the community and the different roles that uh, the fire department plays in that. Uh, and this department focuses on uh, total firefighter utilization. Um, our fighters aren't just responding to call for service and training and being physically fit. Uh, they should be involved in a wide variety of other programs, but if they use up a lot of their time, that's since they're on 24-hour shifts. And they're involved in the uh, breathing apparatus, uh, maintenance, uh, host testing, and things like that. So uh, this is a, a focus of uh, this department. Um, so again, key things in the department, some positive things and some improvement things that Robert's going to start talking about. Uh, again, the fire department effectively utilizes data to make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis and in terms of their own planning for the department. Um, on some getting into some issues, the, the use of a single response time for such a large and diverse municipality such as uh, Anchorage is hurting the agency's ability to meet those goals because you can't meet them. You can't have, have a response time standard that is good for uh, urban, suburban, and essentially rural environments. Uh, so we make some recommendations about formally defining a differential level of service within uh, Anchorage and uh, measure and uh, better meet those, uh, your ability to meet those differential goals. Um, um, again, there are some issues about fire prevention, which we think the fire department needs to address in terms of filling positions and some programmatic uh, things that uh, need to be focused on, including the public education program. So I'm going to turn it over to Robert now, and he's going to walk you through the key recommendations in the report, starting off with uh, organizational structure. 
Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, as we went through the organizational structure, uh, we saw issues with the level of responsibility, authority, and title. And specifically, this really dealt with the, the fire marshal position. It was um, in, a, in a lower capacity than the, the other division heads that we felt it should be fully funded. Uh, that position is fully funded staff and upgraded to the rank of, of deputy chief, chief to be commensurate with uh, the life positions that are overseeing operations and administrations. Um, and then we also thought the span of control was, was quite extensive for this position and thought that I, for the fire inspector positions should be upgraded to a working supervisor for the, uh, position to upgrade to uh, improve the span of control in, in fire prevention and let the uh, fire marshal focus more on the overall management of that division. Next is support services. As we continue, the, um, the county, the agency does an excellent job at the initial and ongoing training of the line personnel and the personnel that are responding to the emergency calls. But a gap uh, existed in the training programs. Once people made the level of uh, deputy chief, there, there's limited opportunities in the municipality um, and uh, local expertise to do that command staff level training. And, and the high level of training that the, the chief level officers needed. Um, and we think it's important that just as you invest with the line personnel, that you invest in training the, uh, the chief level officers to make sure that the battalion chiefs are able to continue to progress, move up, and assume higher level positions as retirements occur, and that the existing chief level officers in the administrative positions um, are able to keep up with best management, management practices and trends. And also, that's going to take an investment in terms of, of travel, travel dollars, as well as the, the costs of the conferences or co courses. Because typically, they won't, won't be uh, located or available in the, in the direct Anchorage area. Um, another issue in the support area was the lack of coordination with the police department on IT projects. Um, as we stated earlier, the fire department's making great use of technology, uh, excellent use. Of, of using that technology to drive data in the organization, but we found a disconnect with the uh, police department, especially where uh, some joint technology uh, can be implemented at the same time. Um, there's not that ongoing discussion so that the two agencies know what each other are planning to implement. And I think uh, as we move a little later, the TAD RMS issue is a great example of how when they work together, it may be able to improve overall services municipality by both of the organizations. Operation? So the established response time goals, currently the agency is unable to, to meet those. And they they um, look at cardiac arrest and structure fires only in terms of how, how well they're meeting the established response goals. One thing is that we thought is that they should look at all the, the code red calls as, as those um, directly affect uh, immediate risks to life and property. Um, the call processing times fall well short of the uh, 60 seconds, 90 percent of the time for both fire and EMS, and, and largely that's due to the fact that the call is taken at the police dispatch center and it has to be transferred to the fire dispatch center and the information re-entered because of the separation of the CAD systems and they're not able to auto-populate. Um, with burnout time, of 90 seconds, 90% of the time. Uh, they're just about meeting it on the fire calls, but are falling uh, a little short on EMS calls. And then a four minute travel time standard, um, they're not able to meet that. Again, that's largely due to the, the areas outside the bowl where the travel times are going to be longer. Uh, the road network isn't, isn't as well defined, especially in winter where, where there's um, weather issues that are going to delay the response. So we look at doing a, a tiered response for, for different populations and risk areas in the municipality. Back to support. Well, we looked at, we continue to look at support, um, particularly in the training. The uh, agency does a good job of using platoon training officers, which are shift captains that volunteer for a one-year assignment to conduct, um, to work in the training and, and help coordinate training programs. At the, uh, at the training center. 
but they are they do remain on the 24 hour Kelly shift and, and we didn't find that that was the best use of, the, of their time uh, when we looked at we looked at their their, uh, their time usage one of the things that was brought up is is the benefit of keeping on that is that they're able to respond to calls after hours assist with incident command and work uh, in calls we found that they were actually running more responses um, or an equal number of responses in the daytime uh, and just a few more during the nighttime hours and it accounted for less than one call per shift and the average committed time was uh, just over 20 minutes um, per call so when we broke that out it, it averaged 16 minutes committed time per shift after six o'clock at night to uh, eight o'clock in the morning and we thought by making them uh, dedicated to the training center working uh, a traditional 40 hour a week whether that's four tens or five eights, uh, would make better use of their time and have them able to improve the coordination and execution of the training programs. In the operations divisions, uh, we did notice that from about 1 in the afternoon to 8 p.m., the EMS system uh, or the ambulances are at or near capacity in terms of the, uh, the workload and their ability to continue to be available to respond to emergency calls. Um, there's typically nine ambulances uh, running at any one time, and average units required did go up to as high as 9.27, so just around one unit short during those uh, peak call load times. Uh, and also a benchmark for individual units is, is approximately 3,500 calls, and, and as you can see by the chart, there's a number of the ambulances that are well over that, that 3,500 uh, call mark, which is showing that other calls, other units are going to often have to respond to calls in their districts because they're, they're uh, at near full utilization. When we looked at the uh, findings and recommendations related to the operations division, um, the first thing was that we thought you should adopt response time goals based on population density and identified risks. So those areas that are more rural and don't have higher hazard risks, um, you would actually structure a travel time that's longer than in the urban settings or the higher risk areas. Uh, we also thought that the fire department should begin to staff medic too. And we put a couple of options in there. One was to negotiate with the union to staff it for peak call times um, using some of some of the personnel from the four main uh, units, taking it from eight units being staffed with four personnel down to six during those peak times. With that additional medic, obviously being able to respond to uh, all types of calls for service, but it wouldn't re uh, require an immediate hiring of personnel. Um, short of that uh, being able to occur, we uh, believe that you should uh, hire additional personnel to staff medic two full time. Um, we should also continue to plan to develop a station in the midtown portion of Anchorage as, as this development continues and to further uh, alleviate the, the call concurrence issues with medics one and three. Um, we also reviewed the special response teams and found that based on the risks present in your community and the fact that the agency is predominantly using part-time teams um, to staff these functions, but they are effectively staffed and utilized based on the risks and occurrence of uh, incidents. In the fire prevention division, um, again, the fire marshal position should be permanently filled. Uh, it should be uh, filled and staffed at the rank of deputy chief. Um, currently, the inspection personnel in fire prevention are only able to conduct the mandated state inspections, and, and quite frankly, they, they often fall behind on those. Uh, and we thought an excellent interim approach would be to, to train company officers to that basic inspector standard and then implement a company inspection program. The ship personnel are already doing um, pre-hazard plans. But while they're doing these pre-plans, they can also um, conduct company inspections, um, report any deficiencies to the uh, fire inspectors that <coughs> to file up with noted deficiencies, but keep those um, lower and moderate risk hazards from having to be inspected by the fire prevention personnel. Also, the lone fire investigator 
really doesn't have adequate support. The, the backup is in the form of the inspectors who are already unable to handle their, their workload. So uh, we thought it would be better to train some ship personnel in, in cause and origin, um, have basically a, an RC task force formation where it's a combination of ship personnel and the fire investigator. The ship personnel can do the initial cause and origin, and then the inspector can do the follow-up investigations and, and the prosecution of the cases. Also, fire ed public education is uh, lacking severely. It's, it's really left up to the individual companies as schools or organizations request um, public fire education programs, but there's no coordinated effort. Uh, we thought it was important to, to hire two public fire education specialists to coordinate those efforts um, teach classes, and then also um, schedule and, and increase the involvement of the, the fire companies in providing public education in their areas so that it's consistent throughout the municipality. Okay, that's it for fire. Do you want to take questions on fire now or go straight through the TAD RMS? I'd, I'd, uh, I'd well. like to handle questions on fire. Mr. Birch? I had a question on fire as it relates to, I, and I apologize, I've not uh, read this in detail yet, but uh, one of the concerns we had in, in, I represent South Anchorage on the assembly, was a potential closure of the of Station 15 off of Southport, which is a brand new facility, and the, the closure was potentially necessitated by a contract provision that stipulated that there be four, uh, four uh, employees on a, on a rig. Uh, the, the, the representative of the union on that uh, provision was willing to reduce that provision to go down to three or if necessary for a contract extension but not for the purposes of uh, uh, continuing the operation of that station. And I guess my question for you is how often, what do you see typically as a, uh, 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 the, the fire chief having the ability to staff the, the equipment resources for the department? Uh, is that, I mean, is that typically bound up in a contract provision, or is the chief typically permitted to manage that directly? It, it varies. Uh, Robert, you can back me up on this, and we do this in surveys as well as our work at various fire departments. I, I'd say that it's in the contract uh, possibly about a third of the time. Uh, but even if it's not specifically in the contract, it's... Uh, it would be very difficult to uh, change from whatever the prevailing practice is in a particular department because of uh, existing practice. Robert? Yeah, the, um, I would agree. And, and the provision in, in Anchorage doesn't stipulate what piece of apparatus or which, um, which station will have the four-person minimum. It's really based on as, as personnel show up. So uh, Station 15 is not specifically designated as a four-person company station. Mr. Stark? All right, thanks for the detailed summary. I represent one of the more rural designated areas. If you look at your page 69 of your report, it has a, a block line that illustrates the fire service area for station 11. It's up towards the top of the page, and that's a area that it does have those rural characteristics that you point out. I have two questions. One of them is, have you actually seen communities that have a two-tier response uh, plan that, that makes sense? And, and as it relates to that two-tier plan, is it just an automatic assumption that we're going to move to a higher ISO classification and all the ramifications that go with that? And then secondly, um, if, if that's the recommendation of that, how do you, how do you more fiscally uh, alert your taxpayers that we're going to charge you the full rate for response, but you're going to get a lesser standard. What's the justifications that uh, a legislator could use? Robert, well, do you want to take the lead in that? And I'll back you up. Yeah, yeah I think what's, in, what's important is when you look at the, the current ability today, um, they're not able to meet that four minute standard to those more rural areas. Um, and it's, it's a no weakness. Now, the school of thought right now is, well, we know we can't do it because there's fewer calls there um, and we're able to do it in the more densely populated areas, uh, it'll offset our ability. But so we look at it in, in terms of transparency to the community. And typically when people move to the more rural areas, um, you know, on the, 
<laughs> side of a mountain, for lack of a better term. You know, they know that they're not within five minutes of a fire station. So it's becoming transparent, and it's it's telling uh, the municipality and, and people that hey, when you make a choice to live further outside the core of the municipality where it's more densely populated, it does take us a little longer. Service times are a little longer, and you can still I mean they're still within reason. <laughs> the uh, but instead of telling them to get there in four minutes, ninety percent of the time, you're going to tell them for those high priority calls to take six minutes, thirty seconds. 90% of the time for those suburban type risks. Mr. Burton, well, I had some, I mean, the, what about the ISO rating class? Do you just no, tell no tell your ISO rating agency that you're going to shoot for a target five and increase everybody's premiums, or how do you manage the logistics of a two tier? Oh, I, I, was, just, I was just addressing that, and Robert, you can back me up on that. that you know, this is not an uncommon problem for larger municipalities. Uh, you know, a lot of municipalities in the Midwest, for example, can be a couple hundred square miles in size, but the, the city is uh, some urbanized core and suburban outlying, just like just like Anchorage can be. And uh, unless it's a district that takes in much larger area than that, and it's farm country and things like that, larger than what we're talking about in the main uh, municipality of, of Anchorage, you, uh, you're not going to get a separate classification for ISO. Well, we, we of course have that fire service area, the FSA, but um, I, I guess the other question I have, and, and then I'll move on, is did you correlate any, any uh, forecasted growth modeling uh, in, in that some of the reasons that we have that rural nature is because we haven't needed to develop the land, but the increased pressures in those areas, uh, it's not just a matter of moving up on the hillside, I think it's just now that's the only thing that's left. So did you look at any growth models there? You know, when we talked to the folks in the, in the planning, um, they said the primary growth was going to continue to be in the Midtown area, um, kind of in more of a, a mid-rise um, formation uh, in the immediate uh, short term, and then outlying areas would, would continue to grow slowly. Yeah, they tend to forget about us, but that's okay. Thank you very much. I've got, Mr. I've got Mr. Birch and Industry Trumley. Mr. Birch? Yeah, I'd just uh, on the... I'd like to ask a question, Jennifer. Gotcha. Uh, just a question on the EMS uh, response. We have been approached uh, the, currently in downtown Anchorage, the Community Service Patrol, uh, which is, I, I guess, a contracted entity, uh, picks up inebriates uh, and, and basically transports them to where they need to recover. And uh, there's a kind of an effort to expand that. And my question is, you know, first of all, how you distinguish between a neighbor on the street and somebody with a, a tourist with a heart attack, uh, and 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 what you see as a potential for expanding contracted EMS services. I mean, it, it strikes me that that you know we currently roll a whole lot of equipment to uh, uh, to a medical response, uh, and I, I guess I'm just I. I be interested in your perspective on contracted uh, EMS services to the extent that we're looking at it here. Um, now are you talking about bringing in a third party ambulance company or are you talking just expanding the, um, the service patrol? The, currently we're looking at modifying uh, response to a, a person you know collapsed on the street uh, in downtown Anchorage, uh, in a means that uh, you know, to try to distinguish, you know, what what type of response they're going to receive, and I guess I'm, and that's being contracted out. I guess it begs the question of, of you know, what uh, what potential is there for expanded uh, contract operations for emergency response? Well, it's going to be uh, difficult, especially with, when you're dealing with the inebriants, because uh, I know in the discussions with the fire department. Typically, those calls come in as a man down, um, so it's some sort of unconscious person, and you really can't differentiate whether this is just an inebriated person that's passed out or it's somebody that suffered a, uh, a serious uh, medical ailment and has caused them to go down. And uh, you know, I think the way it works today is you've got that two-tiered system where the ambulance doesn't stay tied up on inebriates and, and they're transported by a second agency, which works well. Um, but, but it's going to be difficult on the front end to really be able to sort those calls any better than we do it today with the use of emergency medical dispatch until somebody is able to be on scene and, and assess that, that patient.
Okay, thank you. Mr. Trombley, then Ms. Johnston. On page 12, and in, in the initial summary of the recommendations that you have, you say fully staff the fire marshal, and you, you note that the fire marshal position is within the fire department's budget, but it's never been completely, uh, but it's never been filled full time. Did you get an understanding as to why that's the case? If it's within the budget? Well, the, the, uh, the position uh, is, is listed as a position, but they've been using a, a fire inspector to fill it for the past few years. And because of the fact that it hasn't been fully funded, um, so there's been an acting person in a, in a temporary capacity um, as kind of a stopgap measure until that position becomes fully funded again. At a, at a lower compensation level. Right. Ms. Johnston? Yes, um, on page 88, there's a discussion about the ISO classification and how that relates to our insurance. And could you just expand on that a little bit as we look at the, the two-tier urban versus rural? Well, it's interesting. Um, in, in the recent years, the ISO classification by itself has been less of a factor. The insurance companies have begun, begun um, using historical loss of risk as, as the basis, and the ISO rating is only one component of that. So um, you've currently got different ISO ratings for hydrated versus unhydrated areas anyway, and changing the response times to fit the suburban, rural, um, or wilderness settings would impact the, uh, the current ISO ratings in those areas. The only way you could go it would change is if you completely stop providing fire protection service to the rural areas. Oh, so you're saying that maybe the ISO rating does not have as large of an impact? It, does, it doesn't have as large of an impact as it used to. Uh, today it's only one of many measures that the insurance companies use, whereas it used to be a standalone, uh, depending on your ISO rating, largely determined your insurance premiums, but that's not the case anymore. Thank you. Mr. Michaelis? Yes, if, if I could just call everybody's attention to a couple of different pages in here. If you look at page 119, you'll see there, the question was asked earlier about staffing levels. You'll see a comparison of staffing levels uh, from different cities uh, as to how they staff the, ver the various apparatus. And I just think uh, you, know, you should note that. Thank you. And then the other thing that I would like to point out to you is on page 66. If you look at the recommendation on page 66, uh, you'll see in there that they do, and the reason this is important is because it's coming before you on Tuesday evening, you see that they do recommend the relocation of Station 9 and also Station 3. i just like to point that out. Thank you. Let's move on to E911 and NG911. Everything kind of covered walk you through presentations. Uh, but this study was quite a bit different. Uh, it really wasn't a, a management staffing and operations study. It was really two things. It was looking at uh, what the needs were for uh, replacing or updating the computer aided dispatch and uh, records management systems in place in police and fire. It had some urgency for the police department because they were notified by their CAD vendor, uh, Tiburon, that they weren't going to support the version that they had. So they had to do something. And so that was kind of the trigger for this whole thing. And this trigger was, uh, what are the needs of the police department for a CAD system? Uh, could the police department uh, have a joint CAD system with the fire department, uh, either their current one or some uh, replacement to both that uh, met both of their needs? So. Uh, that feasibility study that incorporated the needs uh, of police and fire were very much a part of that. So where that cascade in decisions from that point is, what, is saying that, well, if you uh, have an opportunity to uh, consolidate the technology behind dispatch, what's the feasibility of combining uh, the person
personnel behind it and the dispatch centers themselves. So we looked at that. So in addition to looking at the functional and technical requirements for CAD and RMS needs within police and fire, as well as the 911 system, uh, we looked at the feasibility of, uh, of combining dispatch centers. Uh, and we'll explain what we did on that in a second. Uh, we're also set the stage in uh, what is our third phase in this study, uh, and that is developing the technical specifications for a replacement for uh, catalytic system. So similar to the uh, fire study, we introduced uh, personnel both in police and fire. We talked to management personnel uh, in both departments. We talked to the dispatch center supervisors or managers in each area. We talked to shift supervisors. We sat in the centers and with both of the centers for long periods of time and interviewed dispatchers as part of that. We collected extensive information about uh, calls for service handled, about dispatches, about telephone calls coming in, other workloads that are handled by dispatchers in both of the centers as a way of building up an assessment of the uh, workload and the capacity of uh, dispatchers to handle uh, additional work or different kinds of work, et cetera. Um, so that gave us an understanding of the operations, workload staffing, and organization in each one of the dispatch centers. We reviewed in detail, and we had uh, a technology subcontractor working on our team uh, who reviewed the use of technology in each one of the dispatch centers, and essentially for the two departments overall. And uh, uh, evaluated that and uh, established the need for uh, the future. And as with the fire study, we met uh, extensively through the process with dispatch center managers, with uh, police and fire department management staff, and with our broadly based project steering committee. The key thing, we found that there are opportunities to utilize a single CAD system for both police and fire. Uh, and uh, as that uh, replacement comes into play, you need to make sure that it's able to handle the next generation uh, 911 requirements. That's what NG911 uh, stands for. And what that is, is uh, even if you can't do it now or can't afford it now or the systems aren't in place in Alaska to handle this now, which they aren't, is to uh, be able to handle in the future texting, uh, video and photographs and uh, other non-traditional ways of handling information about problems in the community through the 911 center. Um, as there are opportunities to utilize the single CAD system in both police and fire, we believe there are opportunities to consolidate the dispatch centers themselves uh, as a way to enhance service delivery and, uh, and uh, a, a service level or service delivery lift that happens right now in the transfer of the, uh, the 911 call, which comes into a centralized place, which is the police dispatch center, but then uh, needs to be transferred to fire for a fire emergency medical services call. So if you went down that route, uh, we looked at the system requirements for that, as well as the facilities involved, because neither facility in police and fire lends themselves immediately to accommodating the other service, so there would have to be not only technology changes, but also facility changes as well. So I'll have uh, Robert walk you through that analysis now. Robert? So as we went through the dispatch centers, the, the first thing that, that jumps out is moving to the single CAD. Um, and regardless of, of any consolidation efforts or any other changes that you make, this single change will improve your operations. Because what can happen is, as a police dispatcher is taking the initial 911 call, um, that data can be pushed directly over to fire dispatch, and that duplication of effort of having to re ask the questions to the caller and regain uh, call location and other critical information about what's happening at the location um, would not have to occur anymore. So, so that, that one move of going to the single CAD system will uh, improve service to the customer because you have to think that from the customer standpoint, the call really starts when they dial 911 and they don't know what's going on for that three or four minutes today where uh, until a unit's being dispatched, all they know is that they call, they tell the story, they got transferred, they had to tell the story again, and then it's got around. So to them, you're responsible.
response times are two or three minutes longer than, than what uh, the travel time would suggest just because of the delay in the call processing and going to a single cabinet fix that. So um, the recommendation is that you select and implement a single shared CAD system for both police and fire to, to accomplish that. The records management systems, um, it's not uncommon for police and fire agencies to either A, have a single shared records management system to or um, go on, on separate systems. Uh, it's really whatever meets the, the data collection and data analysis needs of the agencies. So as the CAD system is being developed, um, both agencies should look at the records management systems, make sure it's compatible, and really the key is, is that whatever CAD system is chosen, that it's able to uh, seamlessly push the data from the CAD into the records management system to ensure the integrity of the, uh, the call time and you know, from the 911 CAD system. Also, as part of the uh, timeline, we looked at upgrading the 911 phone system. And again, uh, the agency should review and purchase a new 911 phone system that is next-gen 911 capable. Again, you're going to be ahead of the phone company in terms of this. They don't provide the next-gen technology to be able to push that information into the dispatch center. But by ensuring that it is uh, next-gen capable, then the phone company makes those system upgrades and, and they're capable of, of handling that increased data across their systems, they would be able to uh, be turned on in the dispatch center uh, at the same time that it's available for the public. When it came to a consolidated 911 facilities, uh, we looked at, at the renovations, and both centers uh, could be renovated to, to house a consolidated center, but the fire department location would uh, require significantly much more construction uh, and, and costs to renovate. And so we felt the police department location is, is a more effective and more cost-effective option as they're just a, having to capture an adjoining room. Um, we felt that to fully consolidate by the time we worked through the labor issues, uh, the technology issues, and, and getting new policies and procedures in place for how the joint operation would run, they would take about 36 months to to um, consolidate the centers. And one thing that's important is while there are, are some cost savings for personnel um, and, and some efficiencies gained if the centers come together, uh, by no means can we say to eliminate those positions today. Um, they should be eliminated through regular attrition after the uh, after the centers are, are combined. And as dispatch positions end, then you would slowly rehire call takers until you achieve the uh, 18 recommended call taker positions and um, have the full staffing. The other thing that's important is with the fully consolidated center, you'd be saving uh, costs in terms of management as you would only need one. And with the separate centers, there's two. Um, eight supervisors will be assigned to oversee the center. And then you have a total of 64 call taker and dispatch positions in the center. Today there will be more dispatchers than we recommend because that's what you, you've hired and call takers are really uh, only people that weren't able to complete the full dispatch training. But as you move on, we would recommend hiring uh, positions specifically for the call taker. And then we also had, uh, recommended the addition of a training and CQI position that can specifically look at the training needs, oversee that function, and conduct quality insurance on, on the calls for service, particularly the critical calls, to find out where uh, dispatch is missing the mark, where they can improve, and to ultimately move the center toward being able to meet those best practices of, of dispatching calls within 60 seconds, 90% of the time, for the high priority calls. And that's our CAD RMS report. Okay, I've got Mr. Birch and then Mr. Stark. Got a question on the, you see, it's 18 positions. Uh, I think that's roughly five, if you're staffing something 24-7, it's roughly five times 18, or I guess that's your total number of, of positions there for a 24-7 operation. Eight, do we, what's the average number of 911 calls? I mean, are, are there, is, is there necessary to have 18 people fielding 911 calls on a 24-7 uh, around the clock basis? Well, it's, uh, it's more than just the 911 calls. There's also administrative lines that ring in there, and then um, the fire department this year started 
processing and taking the calls for the service patrol, um, which, which uh, drive the need for additional abilities to uh, take and process those calls. Do you, do you have a count, and I, I apologize for not having read this uh, yet, but do you have a count in here of how many calls that represents per hour? Yes, there, uh, and I don't have the report right in front of me, but there is a chart that shows call breakdowns by day a week and hour a day. And that would be total calls. Okay, I, I guess I can look that up offline. And just as a follow-up, uh, at a question regarding... Uh, in, in, in Anchorage, we also have uh, police services provided in the Girdwood area by the Alaska State Troopers uh, within the municipality. And uh, I guess my question is, uh, what's been your experience as far as integrating a 911 operation perhaps with, the, uh, with other uh, uh, law enforcement entities in the, in the same jurisdiction? Well, that, that happens uh, very commonly in other parts of the country. Uh, you mentioned state police. There are other whole states, like the state of Maine, where uh, the state police has a very active role in uh, providing or sharing in joint dispatching with uh, county sheriffs and with municipalities. Uh, in other more urbanized parts of the United States, it's very common to have county dispatch systems or regional dispatch systems that can have 10, 5 to 10 agencies or more participating. I, I, I add that because uh, uh, Ms. Johnston and I and Mr. Starr and Mr. Kambosky represent areas of the community where they're fairly rural, and we've had some actual problems uh, with, uh, with response, if you will, to uh, uh, accidents in the park where there's some jurisdictional dispute about you know, whether it's a, uh, a state or a, a city response requirement. And I, I just see some merit to having a co-located or a cooperation, and maybe even a, a, a you know a, a combined dispatch operation with the state. I just didn't know if you had an opportunity to look at that in this in this uh, context or not. Not within the context of this project, no. Okay. Thank Chief you. Did you have a response to Mr. Birch? <clears throat> I think, um, if I understand this correctly, that number 18 does not mean we have 18 call takers on every shift. That's the total number of call takers that will be employed in this combined center. So there'd be a total number of 64 who are either call takers or dispatchers, 18 of them being right. call takers, the other being able to do either call taking or dispatching. So it's not 18 on it every given time, it's like a third of that. Well, gotcha. Thank you. Mr. Stark. Well, thanks for generating the report. Uh, those that remember the generation of this module, the report came from a direct appropriation from this body, the Assembly's interest in it particularly. And so with that platform, the, the model that uh, you talk about on your uh, page six, which is referenced in the schedule of implementation uh, on that factor, I have, I have two questions. Is your company engaged at all with sort of the RFP sorting out concept? Did we talk about that in the contractual nature of our relationship with your company? Yes. Yes, you're engaging in the RFP process? That's correct. That's the third phase. And we're, that's already under contract with you. It is, and that's the next step. Well, I think the next step is for us to decide what to do, and that's what we're trying to do. So I'm concerned about the timeline as you put on, on your schedule starting in 6 with the dichotomy that Tiburon's going to expire on your fixed date. Um, you're obviously suggesting that we hurry. Uh, I don't want to say hurry, but you're, you're saying we should prioritize this decision. Thank you. I have nobody else in the queue. So if I can just continue a little bit of dialogue, as Mr. Vicalis noted on the Station 9 concept, there is also an action item in front of us um, this coming Tuesday as it relates to this NG911. And for those that remember, our chairman put together a 911 task force, um, somewhat at my push and urge. Uh, for that, and, and we can say that's a, a, a legitimized uh, committee or not. It, it was sort of came in the same realm when AO37 was bubbling, so we had some early discussions that seemed to be best if we stopped the conversations back in the 911 task force that was formed. So a little bit of an opinionated statement, but I, I think I'm, I'm really interested in making sure that we take the lead uh, from an assembly decision-making perspective with clear policy. So 
however it may need to be, but I think we need to, and this is debate, but we need to boldly stand up to the purchase requirements and move the topic along. So I'm going to be firm in asking for support of, of, the, of the direction policy statement that's in front of us on Tuesday, and also to go back and talk about, first off, the positive response that we had from the, the chiefs, the support staff, when we did the 911 task force summary meetings. Granted, I only had one meeting and then an informal one after that, but I'll tell you, these guys know what's going on. Chiefs, both of you should be proud of your staff for how engaged they are. And I was really um, impressed with the direct speak when we had the committee discussion. Uh, Mr. Drozdowski, the Deputy Chief Smith, those folks um, have it. And I, I don't want to get in the way, but this assembly does what we do. We appropriate the dollars. And uh, not only do I have the interest to move the uh, resolution for Tuesday, but as you'll see in the next module of work sessions, um, I'm, I'm moving uh, actual spending plan information. And I, I just think if we miss this next budget cycle, we're going to get in, in the way. No offense to the administration, we're having some experience with Kronos and SAP that's illustrative of how complex this can be. And I will not compromise public safety over uh, us not being able to decide what to do. So thanks for the uh, consult and the, and the uh, ur urging to get us uh, moving. Thank you. Kalis? Uh, no problem, sir. Okay. Completes the work session. We'll start another one in six minutes.